Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 16 in the series on John Bonet Ramsey and arguably this is one of the most important episodes. Probably the next episode might just be a little bit more important just in terms of the crime scene and what happened there. There's a heck of a lot to go through. And what we're going to do in this episode is similar to the previous episode, just in a lot more detail, just because a lot more happened. We are going to review John Bonet's day from the beginning of Christmas Day, and the Ramses gave out their gifts on Christmas morning. And then we want to follow in little John Bonet's footsteps, what happens through the rest of the day. And then we want to go into the evening, and then the mysterious events that transpired after they returned home. And besides the question, who killed John Bonet, we want to look at issues like what time did John Bonet go to bed? Where did she go to bed? And what happened after she went to bed, if she went to bed? We also want to answer kind of a very, very simple question, but not necessarily an easy one, which is at what time did the crime happen? And I think it's safe to say that the crime happened when John and Patsy were asleep. Right Now you may recall in one of the episodes, Patsy saying, if only I woke up, if only I woke up. I do believe she was asleep when the crime happened. I suspect John was asleep as well. And if he took an Ambien, he really would have been out for the count for a large portion of that night. But what about the other people in the household? We're also going to look at something very, very obvious that everyone seems to have missed in the John Bonet Ramsey case. And this too addresses the issue of neglect. Now, it is going to be impossible for me to cover the full range of what happened through the course of this day, uh, Christmas Day, 24 years ago. So what I am going to do is I'm going to put a link to some, some other content I've put up on YouTube that sort of explores in some detail, not necessarily complete detail, other issues such as the last photo of John Bonet Ramsey. I actually ended up writing a book about that last photo called Christmas Star. And in that um, in that book, I explore these issues of neglect in some uh, additional detail. By the way, that book, Christmas Star, has just become available on Amazon in paperback. So I will put a link in the description to that as well. Before we get started with the timeline, I just want to quickly read a message that was posted on Patreon. We were talking about Christmas and, uh, you know, we tend to think that the only way to celebrate Christmas is with a lot of people, with a Christmas tree and that whole kind of conventional thing. But of course, there's a, there are people who feel differently about Christmas. There are people who uh, dread Christmas sometimes and I'm going to read a message. I'm not going to give their name, but the, the message reads, I ate alone today. I didn't make a full Christmas lunch, just some veg and gravy. I was thankful for not having cried today, as I've done on the last four Christmas days without my husband. I saw my grandsons yesterday and adored the fact they were tickled pink with my cat's Christmas present, Flippity Fish. I reckon I should have got them one too. My most fabulous moment was seeing a robin come down to eat a little sweet mince pie in the garden. So maybe I wasn't alone after all. And why I really like this message, and I I appreciate the, the person who wrote it, you know who you are, thank you for writing it, thank you for sharing that, is that you can feel the tragedy around Christmas. You know, it might be um, some a personal tragedy, but it, there may also be something simple that you can take out of it that makes life feel precious. And what I like about this particular person, uh, I think in England, who experienced this was, you know, this little connection with nature. And I, I truly feel you can get a sense of healing and perspective and connection, whether it's to yourself or to a reality or to whatever when you sort of just spend a little bit of time just simply observing whatever it is in nature, whether it's the, you know, the sky, the lay of the land, the birds, the life that is out there. 
And the life that is out there that you see kind of mirrors the life that is in you. The acknowledgement that, that you're also a fragile person. People are more fragile than, than they think. And that is why, why I think also the John Bonet Ramsey case resonates is because we are sort of dimly aware that somewhere behind the massive pageantry, worldwide pageantry of Christmas is a darker side to Christmas. There are people who are alone, broken, ill, old, um, forgotten, and children who are not as loved as one might imagine, families that are not as whole and as um, together and as happy as some people in them might think they might be, or even people looking out from, from, the, inside, from the outside in. And so it's important not to try and drown away that through the pageantry of Christmas. In a way, you've got to take the pageantry aside. And maybe that's a good thing about the Christmas of 2020, is that we were forced to do away with a lot of the pageantry and just settle for the, the minimum, each other. And I must say, for my part, I had quite a good Christmas, a very simple Christmas, but uh, in, more enjoyable than last year. I don't know how it was for you guys. Now, as we go into episode 16, it's important not to project yourself and your Christmas attitude or whatever it is, your family circumstances onto this case. It's very easy to do because we all come from families. We were all children once upon a time. We were, many of us were parents once upon a time. We were brothers, sisters, wives, husbands, whatever. And it's important not to project that or transfer that into the story it's important to let the people in the story tell their story. And that's what we're going to try and do in this episode. Just a final observation before we get into it is that, you know, I was saying that we get sort of healing in nature. And that is sort of the gift in terms of the ancient legacy of Christmas. That is the gift of the Christmas tree. The tree represents abundance. The tree represents, you know, you get the fruits from nature. And what has happened is we've taken that tree from the garden or wherever, the forest. We've cut it down, put it inside our house, houses and sort of cluttered that tree with, I don't know, just merchandise, with um, stuff, with things from a store. And I, I just happened to watch, I, I watched a couple of things, but I watched How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And there's a comment in that movie and in the book, I guess, saying that perhaps Christmas doesn't come from a stall. And that is a very appropriate takeout, not only from that movie, but from the, the John Bonnet Ramsey story. Bear in mind the Ramseys were very wealthy. And th that message, perhaps Christmas didn't, doesn't come from a stall, isn't necessarily directed at adults, although in some cases maybe, but it often needs to be directed at children. That... Christmas isn't just about what you get. You know that message. And so the question is, how did that apply in this case? And we're going to look at that in a bit more detail. To the 100 or so who have subscribed since the last video, uh, welcome and thank you. If you haven't subscribed yet, please uh, click on the link on the bottom right of the video. Like, share, leave a comment. And let's get started. So at the time that I'm recording this video, it is nine minutes past eight in Colorado. And I reckon at about this time, the Ramses were still at the Whites kind of enjoying their dinner around about this time. We're going to circle back to this time. And it's a very important time in the Ramsey story. In fact, it's around the time that many of the true crime uh, narratives sort of kick off. But we're going to take it from Christmas morning. And if you want to get a really good summary of what happened that Christmas morning, that is how the Ramsey's book Death of Innocence kind of kicks off with a description of being woken up by the children early in the morning. And that is from page, I think, two and three of Death of Innocence. And what's really interesting in that uh, account, whether it's accurate or not, is you just get a sense of the dynamic between the entire family, between John Bonet and her parents, between Burke and his parents, between um, 
the parents and John Bonnet, the parents and Burke, and between the children amongst themselves. So in that sense, it's kind of a compli quite a complicated uh, se set of dynamics one's got to go go through. But I'm just going to highlight something that I think is quite interesting and quite pertinent, is that midway through the um, first page, the very first page, dealing with Christmas Day, the Ramses write that the previous year on Christmas Eve, meaning 1995, Burke had gone to bed at the normal time and then gotten up at 12.30 a.m. ready to open presents, right? And they just say, and at that stage he was eight years old going on nine years old, right? And they said that they tried to explain that Santa was still working his way across the country. So you, you've got to be sound asleep to make sure he stops by. But what this is kind of highlighting is the fact that Burke is this sort of unknown quantity in terms of all the Ramses. So you can you can kind of reasonably expect where John Bonet will be and where the parents will be where they will be, but Burke might not be where you'd expect him to be. And that is how the events played out on this particular Christmas day that night. So this is common cause. I'm not speculating, I'm not making something up, but something Burke himself said in his interview with Dr. Phil in 2016. Another question worth, worth asking, and I'm not going to answer it here, but just worth asking is, where did the children sleep um, on Christmas Eve? And I don't know what it's like in your families, but in some cases, the children sleeping habits change because they're going to be woken up early and because certain rooms need to be sequestrated for presents or for whatever. And so sometimes that just changes that aspect. The other aspect is sometimes the children are very excited and um, they, because they're on holiday, they might play um, games and leave their toys in certain rooms. And I, I just remember in my childhood that uh, you did sometimes, um, you would either play in, in your brother or sister's room or they would play in your room. Um, and in some cases, there would be other children sleeping in other rooms, especially when there were other families staying over. So all of that sort of thing can change. Now, in the A Candy Rose timeline, it sort of kicks off with a quote from Death of Innocence, referring to several other unwrapped gifts from Santa were arranged next to the bicycle and the Nintendo. So each child would know whose pile was whose. Now, I find this quite an interesting inclusion in the timeline but it could also just be normal I mean I think that's also especially where you have quite wealthy parents and sort of lavish Christmases there is sometimes the sort of you know this pile is yours that pile is yours whatever but just thinking about it sort of logically in the beginning you sort of want it to be a mystery you want the children not to know what they're getting. And part of that is the excitement of it. And part of the value of doing this now, chronologically, so thinking about Christmas, thinking about this case now, is if you are celebrating Christmas, especially with children, you can kind of feel all the little dynamics that come up around this day, this time of year. And you can kind of then understand what the situation could have been and would have been and should have been in the Ramsey's home where, where you have a situation of lots of Christmas gifts, two young children and, you know, that kind of situation. And so it's not a question that you've necessarily got to imagine it. You can just remember what happened a few hours ago in terms of your experience. Does that make sense? Now, this thing about having a pile so each child would know whose pile was whose, I think... The, I think it sort of suggests more than what it's really saying. Because I think that with the Ramsey children, I think there may have been a certain amount of jealousy between the children. And that can, and I mean, this is true in a lot of house, households. Um, and, and so one of the ways that you want to kind of ameliorate or mitigate those feelings is by saying, you've got 
that's yours. It's almost like if there's a birthday cake, you want to, you know, cut the cake evenly and, and make sure that each child can see, okay, what's on my plate is exactly the same as what's on, on that person's plate, on that child's plate. And so there's no sense of um, nothing to gripe about, nothing to bicker about. You know, everything is being fair, right? No siblings being uh, superseded. No sibling is getting better treatment compared to another one. No sibling is feeling himself impinged or undermined. Does that make sense? So the thing where I'm not sure if I completely agree with the the whole thing is that, so are you telling me John Bonet's pile of presents was the same size as Burke's pile? Now, it might be true. I wasn't there. It could be true. But I personally believe that this is a central issue that that came up in in on Christmas Day. And in fact, why the crime happened. In other words, this issue of well, what did I get compared to what you got? I think is a important part of understanding um, this case. And I've heard a lot of people scoff at that. And especially when I've spoken about um, bicycles and the bicycles is part of what were you know, part of the Christmas fabric in the Ramsey home. I've heard a lot of people scoffing at that. But the reason they're scoffing at that is they are adults thinking about Christmas the way adults think about Christmas. For, for children, Christmas is often the most important day of the whole year. It's a day they've been waiting for. And I can tell you just out of personal experience, and it doesn't mean my, my personal experience applies. It could, and think about your personal experience in this regard as well. But I remember as a very young child also silently wondering you know, what gifts I was going to get because this would be a sign of how much my father or mother or both parents loved me. I, I don't really mean that vis-a-vis -vis my other siblings. I just mean between them and me. So in other words, and I mean, there was a time where my family gave out lavish gifts and we went on quite expensive holidays to the wild coast. And a lot of effort was put into Christmas and a lot of effort was put into giving the children their dream gifts and, you know, absolutely trying to, you know, hit those happy family targets. You want to, you want to have the perfect family. You want to have the perfect Christmas, that kind of thing. And so there were times where you got these incredible gifts and it felt like it's, it's crazy that a, a little child can feel loved and the sense of that life is so perfect through a gift. But there certainly is that moment, you know, where there's this magic, where there's Santa Claus and your parents and the whole world seems like this safe, benign world that cares about you. And, you know, and I guess that is part of the narcissism of a child. A child wants to be valued and gets a sense of this value through these giving of gifts, right? But in the same way, you can feel undermined and it can be through no fault of anyone. You can have a sense that, wow, what that um, sister or brother got or even what my mother got or whatever, that's way more valuable than what anyone else got or what I got or whatever. But there might be some kind of perceived slight that... Well, what, through not doing this, not giving me this, not giving me what I asked for, or giving that person exactly what they asked for and me not quite what I asked for, you've communicated X, Y, Z. Make, does that make sense? And so if you're going to make the argument that John Bernays' pal was just as big as Burke's pal or vice versa, uh, um, and bear in mind there were also the pals of the the parents, then... Bear in mind that John Bonet got a bicycle. Now, it's hard to top that pile, just a bicycle on its own. A bicycle on its own is a very big gift. And obviously, John Bonet's bicycle wasn't wrapped. I suppose it wasn't wrapped. I mean, I'm, you know, based on Christmas photos, I don't think the bicycles were wrapped. But again, coming down to the psychology of a child, um, you know, often the bigger the, the, the present. So in other words, that that gift wrapping, the box that the person comes in, often the bigger in scale, the, the bigger that thing is, the 
bigger the apparent commitment to to you right in a very basic way i mean you could have a big box filled with a sort of a fluffy bear or you could have a big box filled with something more kind of solid like i'm not quite sure um a, a kind of a lego set which are pretty expensive and those were always very delightful to get as, as children and lego i think you can't go wrong with lego over christmas but what i'm saying is you can get a big box with something that's not got so much substance and you can get a big box with something that is wow bonanza right and then of course you get very small little gifts like a little box of chocolates or um, jewelry and all that kind of thing i'm just saying that the mentioning of this you know that the, the ramses themselves are saying you know what we made sure that each child would know whose pile was whose is suggesting that that there was a kind of a fair spread of gifts right well, what, is that how the children felt about it? Now, I don't want to read too much into what Judith Phillips, the family friend and photographer, said about Burke. Uh, she, you know, in the CBS documentary, she said something about him having a chip on his shoulder. Now, any child with a chip on his shoulder, if he had a chip on his shoulder, would feel that chip weighing on him on Christmas Day. So put it this way, if a child with a chip on his shoulder gets exactly what he wants on Christmas Day, everyone's going to be really happy about that. But if a child with a chip on his shoulder or her shoulder doesn't get exactly what she wants and feels that another child did, you're going to feel it. You're going to hear it, right? Now, I can tell you as possibly a child with a chip on his shoulder that when I went to my Christmas celebration uh, on Christmas Eve, now, this year, I was told by my father, you know, we're not going to do any Christmas, whatever. And I was quite relieved. I didn't really want, I didn't really feel like doing it. And I didn't really expect anyone else to do it. Even so, I thought of giving a certain gift that I had and wrapping it. And, and then I thought this could actually cause a sense of insecurity from their side. Well, but, you know, we just want to have a relaxed Christmas. So I then didn't do that. I had a gift to give and I, I didn't give it. And then at the end of the dinner, sort of as I was getting my keys and I was sort of on my way out, I wouldn't say behind my back, but sort of off the side, you know, as a sort of a side show. Um, there was a, a little bit of an exchange of gifts between my father and somebody else. And I was a little bit... Uh, I, fe I felt a feeling, if I can put it that way. And, you know, I'm an adult. So even in that small little dynamic, which I understand, um, I still felt a little bit insecure about and excluded, if I can put it, put it that way. In a small little way. I mean, I certainly don't have, it's not a big gripe, but I'm just saying that is, those are some of the sensations you have over Christmas, okay? So... What the book also goes out of its way to say is that John Bonet asked for Burke's assistance with the name tags and she, since he could read and she couldn't, right? And I um, also find that quite a weird thing. And I mean, I didn't, I didn't compile this timeline. A Candy Rose did. And it's just interesting what they highlighted. I'm going to go through that, but I'm also going to go further than that and also beyond that. So the fact that this is addressed in the, the book, I think is interesting that, that John Bonet is asking Burke for his assistance and, and obviously, I guess, Burke's helping her. I don't know if that would have been the case. I mean, again, I could be imagining things, but if you look at the photos of John Bonet and Burke at Christmas, she's sitting with her back to him and he's kind of looking at the photo, right? And that, I think, is the only Christmas photo from 1996 where you see both of the Ramsey children in the same photo. There's the other one where John Bonet is sort of, she seems to be shouting with glee that she's gotten this bicycle. Burke's nowhere to be seen. He might be playing on his Nintendo. We don't know. There's another one where Patsy's sitting with John Bonet. Where's Burke? He's also not in that picture. And then there's the last photo of John Bonet. Burke's also not in that, that picture, or nobody else for that matter. And that's another kind of mystery around the Christmas of 1996 in the Ramsey home is 
what happened to all the photos? These aren't all the photos, so what happened to them? And it's something that mirrors the McCann case where they were on holiday, on a family holiday, and then you say, okay, well, we need a picture of, of Madeleine McCann because she's missing. Can you give us one? And they end up finding a photo from, I don't know, the distant past when Madeleine was like a year younger and her hair was different and she looked different. And it took ages for them to actually resuscitate a photo from that holiday and then it ended up being a photo that didn't make a lot of sense. It it looked like a photo that could have been taken on the very first day of the holiday and and also photoshopped, in other words, made to look like the family were sitting together at the swimming pool when maybe they weren't. And so you've got to ask yourself, are these family photos missing because it would confirm some sort of fa family dynamic or is it just bad luck that cameras and photos disappear just because of bad luck. So we now go to the twin doll that John Monet got for Christmas. And this was a doll that was like in John Monet's image. So it was like a kind of a life size doll. And there's really a lot to talk about this doll. You know, I think you could make a full episode just on this doll. But all I'm going to say is that you know, this shows quite a lot of commitment and focus on John Bonet. You know, she gets a doll her size that looks like her. What does Burke get? So we know that Burke got Nintendo and John Bonet got a bicycle. So let's say those gifts even each other out. Well, then what about the my twin doll kind of thing? And I know, I think Burke got a radio controlled car. But and again, you might say all of this is silly. But it's silly until you're on the level of a child. For a child, it's supremely important. What did I get? What did you get? Well, I got this and this and this. What did you get? I got this and this and this and this and this and this. And so this My Twin Doll, it also has another aspect to it, which is arguably psychological. And what I mean by that is even Patsy said, you know, when I opened the box and I saw this, blonde figure inside the white box for a moment it felt like or it looked like John Bonet in a coffin that's what Patsy herself said in their book and so the question is how did other family members respond to that and what did other mem family members think of that and if that was actually verbalized did that create certain thoughts in in certain minds right and so, anyway, what um, what I just want to highlight here, and this also comes from Death of Innocence, quote, Patsy rearranged the gifts in John Bonnet's stack so that a very special box would be opened last. Inside was a My Twin doll, fashioned to look like John Bonnet. Now, I just want to again highlight a My Twin doll that is life-size is going to be part of a very, very big pile. In other words, a pile arguably as high as John Bonet was tall, right? Um, of course, if it was lying flat down, but nevertheless, it's still going to be quite a big pile of gifts. You've got to ask, how big was Burke's pile? And you may not care about that, but Burke probably did when he was nine years old. And so it goes on to say... Um, Patsy had furnished the doll maker with a couple of matching outfits so John Bonet and the doll would dress alike. John Bonet held the doll at arm's length and tilted her head slightly. And she said, I really don't think she looks that much like me. Again, um, I've got to say, I don't know whether I agree with that. I have an idea the opposite happened, that there was a lot of fuss about the doll, that John Bonet was very excited about it and really liked it. I could be wrong. Um, but the, given the amount of fuss that went into the doll, sending matching outfits and all that kind of thing, you can kind of imagine almost a little um, little incident right there where Patsy and John Bonet are totally focused on this doll and dressing it up and whatever, because a lot went into it. And um, it's just Burke playing Nintendo, I guess, listening to the, the sort of fussing going on in the background. I'm speculating, but I'm just saying this My Twin Doll sticks out as something specific to that Christmas and something that was an extension of John Bonet's um, 
identity or personality who she was and then you've got to say well what about Burke was there an extension to his so something like did he get something related to scouts did he get a a softball bat or a baseball bat did he get something that um, kind of recognized something that was going on in his life at the time now as far as I know we can go through the list of gifts that Burke got and Jean Bonnet got but we, we know that Burke got a Nintendo 64 and, and apparently he was satisfied with that. And I think the Ramses emphasized that. That's all he wanted. He got what he wanted and he was happy with that. And and then he may have gotten a radio-controlled car and then his father mentions at some point helping him build something, helping him build some kind of model, and um, which could be related to a train set or something. So th- that's... The Burke side of the Christmas gifts equation, the John Bonnet side is something like a bicycle, the twin doll, both big gifts, and then I think she got a um, a gold necklace as well, and there may have been some other jewel. There, there may have been some other gifts as well. Bear in mind also that there were probably gifts on the Christmas tree for the other Ramsey children that wouldn't be opened. And so that creates this sort of lingering sense that Christmas isn't over, if I can put it that way. And it wasn't over because they were going to go to Christmas in Charlevoix and celebrate sort of Christmas after Christmas with the other half of the Ramsey children, okay? And this whole idea of Christmas isn't over is a theme that comes up, first of all, in that card that John Bonnet got from Santa. You know, you can expect a, a secret visit from Santa kind of thing after Christmas and it's also repeated in this idea that the Ramses aren't going to meet their other children and then celebrate after Christmas in Michigan right but think about that in the mind of a child who maybe either feels well is this it I don't know if you've ever had that experience at Christmas maybe as a young teenager (laughs) you know where you start to feel entitled to things and you sort of well, is this it? Is So I got a bar of chocolate and that, and that's it, you know, kind of thing. And so if you have have the sense that, well, there's, there is more to come, there's part two, you might be quite curious, well, uh, what else is there? I would like to see, I would like to check what it is, okay? And so there were still some unopened gifts in the basement. They were wrapped in the basement, and these weren't just any gifts, that's also something quite important to emphasize. They were they were from FAO Schwartz, uh, a boutique toy store in New York. And maybe it was like a case of saving the best for last. But a child that has been waiting, um, like, you know, on the edge of his seat, um, you know, they say money burns a hole in your pocket, but that, that whole sense of can't wait for Christmas and Christmas comes, but now you've still got to wait for the le point culminant and the le point culminant is the climax the climax of christmas the the big gift kind of thing now john bonnet in a way seems to already have uh, received a le point culminant what about burke and is there a le point culminant and is it maybe hiding in the basement the other thing just to mention with this doll that looks just like john bonnet is you can kind of imagine burke uh, looking at this doll but getting a totally different vibe from the doll. In other words, there's the active, moving John Bonnet. There's the sort of, you know, living person. And then, yes, this sort of figurine that represents her, but that can be kind of controlled and manipulated and dressed in certain ways and made to do what you want it to do and whatever, right? I'm just saying it's a kind of a similar dynamic when, for example, if you ride a horse, you suddenly kind of get the sense of, wow, I can actually, I'm smaller than this huge animal and I can actually order it around. I can make it do what I want it to do. And that kind of psychology is is just something maybe to bear in mind. So returning to the the timeline um, that Candy Rose has compiled, it refers to no video was taped. John said that the batteries were dead. In fact, if you look on the counter, that counter where you see the torch, sorry, the flashlight, and the, um, uh, the you see a phone that is charging, 
you also see a video recorder that is charging or, or something that looks like it could be a video recorder. And John said, actually, no, the batteries were dead, so we didn't record any video there. Now, we do know that there is video previously of uh, the Ramsey's recording Christmas. And, you know, if you think, if you had to imagine, okay, what is a lavish Christmas at the Ramsey's? You might think, oh, yeah, bicycles and this and that. Well, in that particular Christmas, the children were even younger. And I think Burke got like a, 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 a miniature, whatever it was, I don't know if it was a Lamborghini, but like a miniature car that you could literally drive. That is, I mean, that is a lavish Christmas for kids, isn't it? And so that was obviously recorded on video camera. And so now it's, with all that was going on that particular year, Patsy's birthday, John's success, John Bonet's success, the whole question is, wouldn't they have recorded this, you know, John Bonet opening her, my twin doll? I mean, a lot of effort had gone into it. Wouldn't they record that? And so they say, no, they didn't. And in Death of Innocence, this is on page four, John says, said something like, since the death of his eldest daughter, he didn't want to take away the moment by stepping out of the scene to videotape or photograph it. He was saying, you know, I felt that life was too precious to want to interrupt it fussing with the camera. He said, I wanted to live in the moment rather than preserving it for later enjoyment. I know what that feels like. I often when I'm not working at home and I go out, I, I simply just don't take my phone. I don't want to interrupt the joy of being disconnected, I guess. So I understand that feeling. I just don't think it applies when you've got children over Christmas. So again, although this is the narrative, I've got a hard time um, believing it entirely uh, or um, understanding it. You know, why would you not uh, record your small children at Christmas? And of course, there are photos at Christmas. So it's not as though John is saying, you know, I didn't do any photography. He did. And if you were doing some photography, why wouldn't you do this? And I don't know about you. I'm from a family that they, we did take, um, even, you know, in the early times when, you know, um, video recorders weren't that, that accessible. Um, my family, my father often did uh, take video of us over Christmas. So immediately after this sort of snippet in the Akandi Rose timeline that refers, you know, that refers to not taking video, there's then the reference to the photo of John Bonet and her mother, and it is kind of labelled or captioned, "Last photograph of John Bonet and Patsy," and of course it isn't. Um, I suppose you could say it's the last photo of. John Bonet and her mother, but it's not the last photo of John Bonet. And I think at the time that this timeline was compiled, it's only very recently that that last photo of John Bonet has been released. And it's one of the, it's kind of a shocking photo of John Bonet because it doesn't look like John Bonet. It doesn't look like any of the photos we've seen of John Bonet. She's not really smiling. She, her face looks a little bit gaunt, a little bit pale. There's a little bit of gray around her eyes um there's a there's a a haunted quality to that photo almost as if she's been crying but it's just not the it, it doesn't hold a candle to the princess the smiling princess and pageant photos that we've seen and you've also got to ask well why was that photo held back if it's been out there all along also were the police in possession of this photo from the word go they might have been we just don't know but when you consider the fact that there was this last photo of John Bonet all along and we didn't know about it for about 23 years, then it makes you wonder what else was out there that was either removed, deleted, taken away and sort of we have been misled that it's not there. And it makes you wonder, well, what about the videotaping? Okay. Then um, we deal with the Christmas breakfast. I don't think I want to spend too much time on that, but it's kind of sketched in a very wholesome way. In fact, the, the entire Christmas play is sketched in a very wholesome way in the Ramsey's book, that it's just this perfect time, perfect moment. It's not interrupted even with them taking video. 
think about the Watts family taking video of their family and what that looked like. You can imagine if um, someone had the power to get rid of that video, um, they would kind of thing in a, in a situation similar to this. Because it doesn't, um, it shows family dynamics that you, you might not feel kind of support this whole idea of this perfect family Christmas postcard scenario. But that, that kind of postcard is very much the case in Death of Innocence. And so you have the children playing with their gifts and everything's very good. And the parents then preparing breakfast, I guess, together in the kitchen. Um, John refers to Patsy and I went to the kitchen and we're preparing our traditional Christmas morning breakfast. And, what, and that's quite a big, lavish breakfast. It's bacon, it's hash browns, it's corned beef hash, it's pancakes. And um, just in my mind, I just can't imagine John making breakfast. Maybe he did. He said, I usually make, made the pancakes. So I got all the ingredients together. And so it's all very um, perfect. It's just this sort of perfect little scenario. And um, he talks about John Bonet always loved to get into the act and um, help pour the, the pancake button. And this reminds me a little bit of Jerry McCann on the night of the abduction, in inverted commas, quote unquote abduction, where he says, to sort of the very last moment before it happens, he sort of says he, you know, looked into the, the bedroom where the children were sleeping, looked in and just had a proud father moment. And he's not doing anything. He's just looking into the bedroom and feeling like, oh, well, I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, this is this is good. I, I feel, and this kind of feels like the same thing. I don't believe that either of these events happened, but they make certainly make for a good story. Wow, so we at past 40 minutes, I don't think I'm going to take it further than this for the folks on YouTube. I must thank a lot of you who have moved over to Patreon. There have been quite a few of you. Uh, it's good to see you there. Bear in mind, this series will continue into early next year. And at the same time, there's going to be the uh, Laurie Vallow uh, series dealing with the latest documentary in, I think, six parts, something like that. So, and that's also on the $2 tier. So if you um, up to it, head on over to Patreon. It's patreon.com slash TCRS. And then just another quick reminder, Christmas Star is available on audiobook on Patreon as well and available on Kindle. And it's just come out in paperback as well. Incidentally, Silver Fox Post Truth has also just come out on paperback. So look out for that. So to the folks on YouTube, thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time. Now, for the guys on Patreon, it's interesting there was an argument on Christmas Day. Just